Babiš. C++, Rust. 
maybe a little bit of Go, maybe a little bit of Zinc, but like really the, are, are those are the main players. But what about us? What about us? We want to win too, you know? Uh, are, we, are we just you know, not putting in the effort, or is there some fundamental reason why it, Haskell and Scheme and Erlang and all these things, why we are not winning on WebAssembly at this point? And to me, the answer is yes. Yes, I, I, I do think there is a, a fundamental reason. Um, and it is that WebAssembly, in its initial form, 1.0 form, the minimum viable product form, or in the form as it's currently deployed, which is WebAssembly 2.0, which is WebAssembly 1 plus a few more extensions, is not well suited to languages with garbage collection. Right? This, is, this is the fundamental issue. This is what has made it so that our languages aren't really having success in WebAssembly. And if we look into why, there are a little bit of, there are a few funny details here. So if you have a language that has garbage collection, let's say Scheme, for example, and you want to target WebAssembly 1.0, what do you do? Right? Where are your values going to live? Well, in WebAssembly 1.0, we have one answer. And that answer is what we call linear memory. Uh, linear memory is just memory uh, with a simplified layout. It's just a buffer accessed by index. In this case, WebAssembly, as you might know, has a text format that corresponds very closely to the binary format. Um, so in this case, we're going to ask for 10 pages of memory. Each page of memory of WebAssembly is 64 kilobytes. That gives us 640, and not for anybody, as we all know. And we're going to uh, use it all for our garbage collected memory. We're going to have a heap pointer, uh, and we're just going to bump pointer allocate from beginning to end. Okay, that, that's how we're going to store our data. This is just like when you compile to native. Um, so, okay, all right. I'm not going to go into too many details for, for this function, but the, the, the basic thing is when you go to allocate uh, some number of bytes, okay, you're going to bump the heap pointer, but if you bump it past the end of memory, you're out of memory. At that point, you need your garbage collector. So that's what we have down here in bold. We're going to call our garbage collector and retry if we run out of memory. Well, what does this mean? It means we have to ship a garbage collector in the binary, right? When you compile your program, which does something that's not garbage collection, to WebAssembly, your compiler and tool chain has to include a garbage collector in that artifact that you deliver to your users. Already, that's, that's annoying because it's size. But it's annoying for many other reasons. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's so annoying that it, it, it pushes the, the calculus from OK to oh, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that, right? And so I'm going to go into the, to the reasons why. So first of all, you ship a garbage collector. Is it going to be a good garbage collector? No, no. <laughs> because there are hundreds of person years in garbage collectors and browsers, and you are not going to do that for your, web, uh, your garbage collector in WebAssembly. Right? Your garbage collector is probably going to be stop the world. It's probably not going to be parallel. WebAssembly has some uh, multiprocessing capabilities, but it doesn't notably have the ability to create a thread on its own. It's probably not going to be concurrent. Um, okay, all right, I'm going to ship a bad GC. Okay. Uh, but we have a problem, and the problem is roots. So in garbage collection, your goal is to preserve the live objects and recycle the space for everything that's not live. A live object is an object that's referred to from the roots, or any object which is referred to from any other live object. It's a circular definition, right? And this set expands as you, as you trace the graph of objects. So what are the roots? We have global variables, okay? And we also have any local that's on an active stack frame. So you have 10 stack frames deep. If you did a backtrace, you'd see 10, 10 frames. In those frames, they're probably holding on to garbage collected values. Those are the roots, right? You start with these values and you, and you um, see what values they, they reference. We have no way to visit the stack in WebAssembly, unlike in a native compiler. And, and this leads to a lot of problems. Um, this, is, this is good in a way because it's an abstraction over the platform and you don't have like stack smashing attacks. Uh, but it's bad for uh, shipping a linear memory GC. It makes it more difficult. There are two workarounds here. One is manually keep track of all the roots. Some language runtimes can do this, right? Uh, unfortunately, this is going to be overhead because every time you add a, another local variable, you have to also perform some bookkeeping that makes it visible to the garbage collector. So you're now building a system that's slower than it could be. Uh, or you could uh, simply tell your compiler to put everything in memory, and you're not going to do any bookkeeping, 
And on the other hand, you're not going to be able to precisely know what the roots are. This is called conservative garbage collection. This can work. It's, it's not a bad solution. It's what most, most garbage collectors in WebAssembly do, actually. Um, the, the state of the art solution is neither of these, right? You have the compiler emit uh, a side table of, for the garbage collector's use, telling the garbage collector where to find the local variables. But you can't do that, right? Because we have no way to communicate with any garbage collector. Uh, we, we have no way to know where we are in the stack in, in WebAssembly. It's, uh, it's a drag. It's annoying. It gets worse. It gets worse. <laughs> like, you, you, start, you start to look at building this system with linear memory and GC. First of all, if you're building a, a web application, you're aiming to d deploy your WebAssembly on the web, then you're going to probably have callbacks from JavaScript. And JavaScript is going to reference WebAssembly objects. This is a very common pattern. It's almost impossible to avoid it. So you're going to have cycles between the JavaScript heap with its garbage collector and our linear me memory heap. And these things don't know anything about each other. These cycles in practice are going to be uncollectable. You're going to lead to memory leaks. Um, it's pretty annoying in that sense. Maybe your application doesn't live so long, so it's okay, but okay, it's another annoyance. And then finally, um, when you give an object to JavaScript, you give it as an integer, specifically an index into that linear memory. And so if JavaScript wants to read or write to that object, it has to have a capability over all linear memory. You have no abstraction at that point. To an extent, if you ship the JavaScript that talks to your WebAssembly, you can maybe try to preserve some of these abstractions, but, but it's not a good system. And, and then if you manage to compact memory, only if you have precise roots, you can't give the memory back to the operating system. There are some pending proposals to do this, but it, it's not the case yet. So, I mean, in, in the eternal uh, dialectic between worse is better and worse is worse, or are we going to build a thing that just um, sort of works, or are we going to build the right thing? I think most people in this room are more on the right thing side of things, right? Okay, you know, it's, nobody's completely in one camp or the other, but I, if you're one of these persons and you check your gut, you're like, no, 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 I'm not going to wait, right? Like, because this is not good enough. What's, and the, the thing that's just so golly about all this is that there's a web, there's a garbage collector right there, right? <laughs> you're, you're shipping your code into a browser that has an excellent garbage collector. Why can't I just use this? Please, 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 please. And so, in the, in the, in the grand sports ball of C++ versus Haskell, C++ is just, you know, scoring goals and scoring goals, right? Like, they, they are, they are winning on WebAssembly, and, and we are not. Um, but, it's halftime, and uh, some things are changing, right? And the good news, I'm here to bring you the good news, right? The good news is that uh, we are going to have support for garbage collection in WebAssembly. And I believe, I mean, it's hard to predict, especially about the future, uh, but I believe this is going to ship uh, this year, right? End of this year. And so what does that mean? Well, I, you know, we're back in the game, right? We can play, uh, but we have to be ready for it. Um, so we have, to, we have to build the compilers that compile our languages to WebAssembly now. Uh, we can do this already because there's some sort of preview version shipping. In this talk, I want to go over uh, a strategy that I'm using to compile Scheme to WebAssembly. Um, in, some, in a collaboration between the company I work with, at Igalia and uh, Sprite Institute, uh, we're building a compiler for all of Guile, eventually, but starting with a, a, a subset of Scheme. And, and the approach that we're taking here is that we're going to try to avoid cutting corners. When you target JavaScript, for example, you have a very strong incentive to make your numbers the same as JavaScript's numbers. Uh, you have a strong incentive to, like, for example, omit multiple value returns, or your different aspects of your language that don't quite fit with your target platform. Um, in this case, we're going to try to just bring the whole language, like see, see where, where do we get and, and what are the, the difficulties we find. And I, I think I've found mostly solutions for all of these. So let's start with, with values and, and specifically how do we work with the garbage collector. The WebAssembly uh, garbage collection proposal, the uh, GC proposal, has three top types. <laughs> it's very funny. Um, you have the any ref type tree, which is the ones that you define in, in WebAssembly. You have extern, which are maybe values from JavaScript, if we talk about a web embedding. And then functions are represented differently for reasons. Um, and then uh, not you can't compare any refs by identity, but there's a subtype called ek, 
uh, that you can compare by identity. You can, you can say, is this value the same as that one? And then of x, there are three, continue, uh, three subtypes, one of them concrete being i31s, 31-bit integers. These are fixed nums, which is great, right? We need fixed nums right? in our languages. And then we have uh, structs, records, and arrays. And structs and arrays are abstract types. You, they have concrete types to their fields. So in Scheme, we're going to use ref ek, a reference to the ek type, uh, as our common value representation. We'll represent immediate values using i31s. And some of that space will be for fixed nums, and some will be for like the true value, the false value, characters, scheme differentiates between characters and, and strings, and, and so on. Um, additionally, in WebAssembly, uh, value types are not nullable that, by default. You have to explicitly mark types as being nullable. In the case of scheme, we don't need uh, null, so, so we're going to do without it. This is going to make our, our compilation a little bit more efficient. For heap objects, which is everything that's not a fixed num, small integer, or like false or something like that, then we're going to have a, a subtype of struct. And, and concretely, we're going to have a, a common supertype for all of these. I didn't think this was going to be necessary before. Um, but the GC proposal has what's called structural type equivalents. Uh, the types that you define in your module uh, are compared by shape and not by name. And so you can have a number of different types that actually de declare the same uh, shapes of fields, and they would be seen as equivalent to, to WebAssembly. Uh, and so you wouldn't be able to do, uh, use the WebAssembly's type test primitives to differentiate between them. We need to be able to do dynamic type checking in, in Scheme. Uh, so we need uh, a field uh, with a type tag value. That's, that's going to be how we uh, do dynamic type checks. We also need to be able to hash values for on their identity. And so we need a space for a hash value, uh, just as in Java. So we're going to use that one i32 uh, field that every object on the heap is going to have. And that's going to have the hash code and the type tag. So for example, a pair will be a subtype of heap object with the first i32 field, which is that uh, tag and hash field. You have to mention all the super type fields when you make the subtype. Uh, and then it's going to have two other fields, which are our car and our coder of our pair. Okay, great. Um, it shows uh, defining specific struct types and, and subtyping. You can also subtype functions and arrays. Um, and if we look at our const function, then it's a function that takes two arguments. Both of them are references to ek, and it creates a new struct. And then the system manages it. It's wonderful. Um, and if we want to access the first field, we use struct get. And when this code is compiled on V8, for example, it's my usual testing platform for this, it's quite efficient, actually. Um, it, it, it's even more efficient than, than if you compile the JavaScript because there are fewer extraneous cases that you might have to handle. I put in bold here that this car function, which I put with a print, uh, percent, before the name, indicating it's kind of like internal or a system function. It's because the parameter is the concrete type of the pair. And you don't get any sort of magic to cast one, an instance of the unit type, ref ek, to this concrete type. You need to do dynamic type checking, which is the horror that is in the next slide, right? I have two bits that are in bold. It's kind of hard to see on the slides here, but on the top we have a, a test to see if, if the object has the right shape. We use ref test against the shape pair. And if that doesn't work, then we, we branch out and we call it type error. And then we actually have to get the type field and mask off the little byte and check that against the expected type tag, in our case one. If that doesn't equal, we, we branch off and call it type error. Otherwise, we can, we can actually call the internal function or inline that internal function if you like. That's value representation, right? This is how we use uh, the WebAssembly proposal to define types and represent uh, the source languages types using uh, GC types. Uh, scheme is 
funny. It's got a, a number of, of interesting challenges. And, and one of them for WebAssembly also is their art, uh, variable number of arguments. So let's look into this. The issue is that functions are strongly typed in WebAssembly. If a function says it takes two arguments and they have the type i32 and f64, it can only be called uh, with those types of arguments. Whereas in, in Scheme, not only uh, do we call functions with values of any type, uh, we can call them with any number of values. And that might raise a runtime error if you're calling a function with the wrong number of values. But some functions can accept multiple number of values. And in, in Guile, for example, we use this facility for parsing out keyword arguments or optional arguments and things like this. So how are we going to use uh, what WebAssembly gives us, which is strongly typed functions, to represent functions that can take a variable number of arguments? And the solution is uh, a little bit gnarly, but it's a local transform. Uh, it doesn't, it's not really a whole program transform. We effectively do what the, for example, the x86-64 calling convention is, in which you allocate some number of registers to the first n parameters. And then otherwise, you require your uh, parameters to be passed in memory. And when you call a function, you pass the number of parameters that you're giving it. And given that number of parameters, that function will know, A, is it the right number of parameters? And B, where do I find my values? Like, I, I will find them in, if I'm passed with uh, five parameters, I will find them in arc 0, arc 1, arc 2, arc 3, and then one of them will be in memory. Right? And the, the callee would then be responsible for loading these values into its locals, which will get properly register allocated, and then and continuing uh, like that. So our, our uniform function type is going to take one parameter, which is going to be the, the number of arguments that we get. You can imagine a form of global register allocation in which uh, these global variables are actually allocated to RDI and RC, RSI, and, and the, the actual registers that the machine uses for register allocation and uh, I, I don't think this is going to happen in practice, but it, it's a thought. Okay, but anyway, we have varargs in place. Great. Um, it's, not, it's not too bad. We're, we're moving on. What about tail calls? This is always a story with Scheme. Like we're, uh, for us, we're always like, oh, tail calls, I can't compile to this platform. <laughs> Friends, I almost cried when I made this slide. It's, it's just going to be there. <laughs> it's just there. <laughs> Well, we, the, the instructions return call instead of call, and return call ref if you're calling a function by value. They do tail calls. It's great. It's really great. Um, these aren't quite in the spec yet, but I think they'll land at the same time as, as GC. So uh, I'm, I'm just delighted. This is, uh, this is the part that I like best about this presentation. Later, when I'm done, y'all will tell me what you think, because maybe you won't. <laughs> so if we take the, the problem statement of like, uh, I want lightweight multi-threading, right? Many languages have this. It's kind of table stakes, fibers, uh, virtual threads, whatever you want to call them. Uh, what am I going to do to implement lightweight multi-threading? Well, eventually, WebAssembly might have support for this, right? Uh, coroutines. This is a, a bit far off, uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it right now. Um, there's also a strategy which can be to compile everything as if there's no coroutines and then run a post pass on the whole WebAssembly module using this toolkit called Binarian, which is part of the compilation tool chain to WebAssembly for many projects, to make some functions resumable. Um, it's a little gnarly. I don't think it's ready for GC yet, uh, but Julia uses this in its compilation to linear memory GC. Uh, the other option is to implement limit continuations somehow, and then build your fibers on that. You know, this is a relatively straightforward process, but not the subject of this talk. Um, since the limit continuations are part of uh, Guile anyway, I wanted to have them in there for sure, for sure, for sure. And so, uh, that's my strategy for, for lightweight concurrency. I don't know how many people have actually worked with the scheme for the continuations. I would expect like two in this room. So a little bit of an overview for it. We uh, delimited continuations are called delimited because there's a prompt. In the same way that in an operating system, uh, like say you're at the shell, the prompt delimits the operating system, the thing that's running the processes, from the process that you run. 
right? When the process that you run dies, it doesn't kill your whole machine, it just brings you back to the prompt, right? Uh, this is a pretty rough analogy, but it's one of the original ones when the, when the facility was created in the 80s. Um, so call it prompt effectively establishes a prompt in your program. You get a division between its continuation and the continuation that's being called. Uh, it has a name. This prompt uh, has a tag called foo. That's just the name we'll give to the prompt. And then it has uh, the body of the prompt, uh, which in this case is a function that's going to run. It's going to add 34 to... Ah! There we have abort to prompt. This is the part where I uh, suspend this continuation, return to the handler with a reified copy of that continuation. And in this case, I just re I returned it to value. And so if I um, run k, which is this captured continuation, and I pass it an argument, it's going to be as if that abort to prompt returned with that argument. Um, that if you consider the, the function of no arguments, lambda plus 34 whole, right? The, the k is that whole, effectively. Um, right. It, it, it's a function which, when run, will reinstate that continuation and put the value in the whole in the return. Um, there's a lot more to say about this stuff, but I'm going to just uh, go on to, to discuss how, how this works. So, in, in practice, there are a few ways to embed the linear continuations, but the way I like to do it is as a stack slice. Logically speaking, you have your stack. Let's say it's growing down, right? You're, you're, you're calling, you're calling, you're calling, your function goes down, oh, prompt. Okay, now you're inside your prompt, oh, abort. What is the continuation? It's this stack slice between the prompt and the abort, reified as an object. And to reinstate it, you compose it with the current continuation wherever you are, you, if you call one of these reified continuations, it splats back on that stack, composing it with the current continuation, and restarts it with whatever value you pass into it. That's, this is my in, uh, intuition for what a delimited continuation actually is. And so to implement this on WebAssembly, uh, what I'm doing in Scheme is that I'm running a transformation that turns... This is, this is a little weird. It's, it's called a continuation passing transformation, a particular vari variant of one that um, turns all non-tail calls, all calls that you would need to return to, um, into tail calls. And it does so by, when you get to one of these calls, the compiler knows what variables are going to be needed when it returns. And so the compiler will push those values on an explicit stack. And then it will tail call. Oh, oh, and it will also push where to return onto another stack. And then it tail calls the, the, the function you're calling. <coughs> And when that function uh, returns, uh, well, I think I have this in the next slide, actually. So before a call, I push the live out variables onto a stack. Uh, I push the return continuation on a stack, and I tail call the callee. When that callee returns, it pops the continuation from the stack, and then tail calls it. And that return point is then responsible for uh, taking those values that I pushed onto the stack and pulling them back into the local variables. Um, what does this give you? It gives you a reified stack that you can slice, which is exactly what you need to implement to the continuations. Uh, calling a prompt just captures the current level of the stacks, and aborting to a prompt uh, slurps out those values into some heap object, uh, and then tail calls whatever the prompt's continuation was. And you never have this problem of like needing to jump up and down of the, of the control stack because all your all your calls are tail calls. It's a, it's, a, it's a little deep. I, yeah, like I say, my favorite part, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a little detailed. Right. Um, the cool thing is, is that with this arrangement of uh, delimit continuations, we don't need to wait on anything else. We can ship delimit continuations now, and we don't need to wait on like the effect handler's proposal. We can have effect handlers now, and we don't need to, to wait on, on, on anything else. Um, and incidentally, this also gives you a good error handling story, because whenever there's an error, you just uh, tail call the error handler, and it has all the state reified that it needs to inspect, for example, to give you a backtrace in terms of your own language, or to be able to let you debug and inspect local variables in terms of your own language, or even to modify local variables and resume the continuation. Um, right. So, 
We've done the, the first four. We've done values. We've done the verars, scale calls, limit continuations. Also, Scheme has this, um, although all values are the same type in the sense of, of Bob Harper's unit type, um, we do have different kinds of values, right? We have exact integers. We have inexact reals. We have complex numbers and fractions and, and all kinds of crazy things. Um, when you run the web, the nice thing is that, is that in the same way that you have a garbage collector that's, that's just right there at your reach, right there at your disposal, you also have a, a good implementation of um, arbitrary precision integers, which is uh, big int. So when we need to reach for the general case of where, how do we represent like a big integer, we don't need to uh, just rely on it fitting into a, a floating point number. We can use a proper big int. Uh, value, and then we can use uh, the built-in operations on these big ends, which are also going to be efficient. The result is that you can ship a system with support for all kinds of different numbers, and, and, and you don't have to have it, you don't have to have such a big uh, uh, binary size for your module that you're shipping. Of course, for small numbers, we're going to take advantage of the I31 uh, fixed nums, or I31 immediates, a, a subspace of which we're going to reserve for fixed nums. And for floating point numbers, we, we also have to, unfortunately, make them, in the general case, to be heap objects, unless the compiler can, can unbox them for whatever reason. If you are compiling to a non-web target, though, uh, you obviously can't rely on big int. But since the way that WebAssembly modules compose with each other and with host facilities is actually the same, uh, you can implement that big int functionality via another WebAssembly module. So if you're running your code on like Fastly's Edge Compute platform, then you compose your, um, your, your scheme module uh, with the module providing effectively big edge services, which might be compiled from like uh, GMP or mini GMP or something like this. Right. Good. And that, that pretty much covers it. You know, like when I, when I got to this point that I was, I, I realized that we could do everything, I, I was like, oh, it's go time. It's go time. <laughs> we are going to get... Uh, scheme on the web platform, and I'm happy to, to be able to, to work on this right now. These aren't the only uh, considerations if you're targeting WebAssembly, of course. Uh, it, it, it's a weird machine, uh, and the solutions are weird. Um, for my case, uh, for debugging, I'm going to rely mostly on, on uh, since schemes tend to be self-hosted in important ways, I'm going to continue to rely on the self-hosted uh, debugging facilities to inspect these limited continuations. Um, but the hosts also have support for Dwarf, uh, which you embed in a separate section of your binary or perhaps uh, fetch it uh, asynchronously to complement your binary with external debugging symbols. If you need to um, identify like where, where, where you are in a bit of code. Um, it's, it's limited. Uh, Dwarf wasn't made for WebAssembly. Dwarf was made for machines with fixed numbers of registers, for example, not an infinite number of locals, but there, there it is. Um, for, for strings, I, I'm partial to using the strings from JavaScript as well. Um, JavaScript strings are a little weird also, but uh, you, you can represent all, all values there. They're a particularly good match if you're compiling JVM languages or, or CLR languages. Uh, languages that were defined in the age of UTF-16. Um, this proposal is a little, there, there is a proposal which is in Chrome now, uh, which I've worked on. Um, it's a little bit less sure. So I'm not gonna say like definitely use uh, string ref, even though I, I thought it. Uh, when it comes to interoperation with JavaScript, the weird thing about this is that when you pass a, a value to JavaScript, uh, it's not an index in the linear memory, it is um, an opaque capability, if you will. You can do nothing with it. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the state of, uh, uh, of the compromise between JavaScript and WebAssembly. To, to be able to access anything on this object, you have to uh, call in to the WebAssembly module itself, which would then be able to destructure it or assign values to it or, or what have you. So your module actually needs to export a few accessors. And then in JavaScript, if you were going to have a nice interface, then you would need to uh, wrap this object with some JavaScript wrapper. Um, da, da, da. And just uh, a, a final couple nerdy points. For some languages, it's important to be able to generate code at runtime. And 
in WebAssembly, there will probably be a proposal to be able to do this at some point. It's not there yet. What you can do now is you can uh, actually generate bytes for a new WebAssembly module if you need to generate uh, JIT code, and then instantiate that module in such a way that it shares state with your, your host. It, there are a lot of details here, and I have a, I have a blog post on this if, if you are interested. Finally, there is a WebAssembly to C translator, WASM to C. It doesn't work with GC yet, but it could. And what this would give you for a language that uh, compiles to WebAssembly is ahead of time compilation to any CPU. So you don't need to build your RISC-V backend in a way. You can compile your code to WebAssembly and then use one of these ahead of time WASM to C or WASM to native compilers to produce a native standalone binary uh, for, for any platform, uh, which is pretty tempting. Um, and so, with the GC proposal, I think that, um, like I say, we're, we're in half time, right? C++ has scored a bunch of goals, but I think we're in a good position to equalize in the second half. It's simply a, a small ma matter of programming <laughs> to, to build these uh, compilers and run times and such, but, but I think the time is now. If you'd like to follow along with, uh, with the scheme work, uh, it's still pretty early days, uh, but there's a GitHub repository with where I've been experimenting. Um, and otherwise, uh, it's, been a, it's been a delight, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. I especially like uh, the uh, web assembly S expression syntax. <laughs> That's quite familiar. So, uh, questions? Uh, last time I checked the uh, garbage collection MVP in WebAssembly, it doesn't support uh, weak pointers and final errors. I'm not sure if Scheme supports these kind of language features, so how are you going to be uh, implementing those? Very good question. Um, I think the consensus right now is that uh, this is a host concern. And so to implement uh, weak pointers, you would call out to uh, JavaScript and use weak maps, right, which is uh, ephemerons and actually ephemeron tables. It's a pretty good facility. Um, and on an edge platform, they would need to implement it in some other way. Similarly, for finalizers, there's a JavaScript uh, finalization that's out there in all the browsers. And so you would call out and, and use JavaScript. It's not the kind of finalizer that can resuscitate objects, uh, for better or for worse. So it's really post-mortem finalization. That is a sense in which you, you, you do have to truncate language to platform if, if that's an important thing for, for your language. Yeah. Follow up? Thank you. <laughs> uh, another question is that uh, you mentioned that if you ship your own uh, garbage collector via uh, linear memory, then you have the problem of cycles between the two heaps. But uh, if you are shipping your own garbage collector, then your own garbage collector can know when the object is going to be collected on the linear memory. And on the other side, on the JavaScript heap, you have uh, things like finalizer registry. So you can also have some hooks to uh, fire when a Java, JavaScript object is garbage collected. So I'm sure uh, these two facilities will allow some kind of circle breaking uh, between the two. But that's, a, that's a good point. Actually, there, there is one way that you can break cycles, which is for any link in the cycle to be weak. In that case, it works. It's tough to uh, ensure this by construction, but finalizers uh, alone won't do this because the, um, the especially the, the, Javis, the WebAssembly to JavaScript link is strong, generally. Well, no, that, that one can be uh, seen by the GIS in linear memory. Okay. The uh, WebAssembly to JavaScript link is usually strong, and similarly, the JavaScript to WebAssembly link is, is often strong as well. Um, this is like a combination of ref counting and tracing, and, and it, they really can't do the cycle. Um, to my understanding, I've, I've, I've looked into this a bit, but that's, that's my understanding that it, it's not something that's uh, amenable to like building robust, robust, reliable systems in which you know that it has a property that cycles will be collected. Um, but, but there are workarounds, you're right. Yeah, thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering about your, your slide on type checking, uh, or runtime type checking. You said WASM has a sort of structural type equality. And I'm wondering, is that linear in the size of the object, or? Um, no. 
Uh, one way to implement this is, so, all right, backing up a little bit. What you want here, right? It, on, on the web, all objects on the heap have a um, hidden class or a map word or a structure in the first word. And this points off to something that describes what the, what the object looks like. It's in all the engines. And each object of a different shape has a different map word. And so if you're going to compare objects that they are the same, uh, exactly the same shape, uh, for example, for final uh, types, types and subtypes, then you should be able to just compare those map words. This is what you want. Uh, WebAssembly doesn't have this right now. Um, that is nominal typing or runtime typing. Uh, and so what instead has is structural typing, okay? Um, there is an O1 way to implement this in which uh, you still have the, the map word internally. As part of that structure, you have a list of all the supertypes of the value. And if they share a common prefix, and if the value is a certain, if they share, um, let's say, you're asking if X is a subtype of Y, right, structurally. Um, first of all, what that means structurally is, in the terms of WebAssembly, is do they have the same fields? Um, the first number of fields, and is one marked as a, as a subtype of the other, right? So, you, so you're really checking like a linear subtyping hierarchy, and, and that's something you can do with an O1 operation. There, I'm not explaining myself very well, but there's not a linear check to do that. That's perfect. That's all I want. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought that JHC had the WebAssembly backend you say, are they winning? <laughs> huh? Are they winning, though? I, I don't know. Does it have all the, uh, all the disadvantages you talked about? Or? Well, I mean, so, so I don't know if they're winning. Right? So I, I don't profess the knowledge in that regard. I'm working on it. Are you, <laughs> are you working on winning? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> now is the time. But I would suspect uh, that it is... Uh, slower than it could be because you can't implement GC over linear memory as fast as uh, a system with a host garbage collector. Rough approximation. And, and I would suspect also that the binary size of these uh, compiled artifacts is larger than you would want. And I would also suspect that interoperability with the host, in particular JavaScript, is suboptimal. But you're absolutely right that you can get it to work right now. And I think Haskell is probably you know, well positioned uh, already having this to take advantage of, of the built-in garbage collector. We have time for one last question. Uh, okay, so I have a question about control flow. So when you translate your program, well, into program state calls, um, well, you actually uh, stop using the hardware stack. Yes. And yeah. so you, um, so we, you will lose some efficiency. Yeah. yeah. And every program, even programs that do not use delimited coordinations, have to pay the cost. Yeah. Have you measured this? No, I haven't done it. Okay, and uh, yeah, and, and this wasn't to see how does it feel with uh, tail calls? Because I mean, the C platform does mm -hmm. not have tail calls. I think it probably doesn't. I haven't checked actually, but since tail calls aren't part of the official standard right now, I don't think that WASMC would would support them right now. Um, that, that's a good question. Um, with regards to the CPS conversion, I I, I completely agree. There's going to be a performance hit. Um, hopefully, not too bad because hopefully your program is spending time in inner loops and inner loops without a call inside them don't need to undergo this um, separation of multiple functions in, in a weird combination. Great talk, thank you very much.